the Scientific Systems Engineer at BioTeam, and uh, I'm really excited to be here today in Utrecht um, to talk about IRODS. Um, I want to thank the IRODS Consortium for inviting Aaron and I to speak today. Uh, we're really, we really love IRODS and the surrounding community, and um, we're very passionate about data management, uh, so we're very excited to share our, our ideas uh, relating to development. Um, I'm a little bit surprised we made it across the border earlier this week, uh, considering that we're both Florida men. Um, that was probably an unwise decision by the border agent, but uh, a gracious one nonetheless. Uh, so today I'll be going over the development stack I use at BioTeam, uh, which as you can probably guess from the title, uh, consists mostly of Golang. And um, I'd like to describe the different integration points IROTS has available for developers and how you can utilize Golang at these integration points. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about the domain of life sciences and the type of data we manage with IROTS. All right, so let's get started. <coughs> All right, um, so here's the roadmap uh, from the, for the presentation. Um, uh, first, I'll start by uh, providing my idea of what an IROTS data management system would look like. Um, I'll go over a few data formats used in um, a few of the automated bioinformatics pipelines. I'll go over how that data can be used in a tiered storage configuration. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my vision for a GUI and um, how you can use that GUI to um, automate the design, um, data discovery, and delivery of your uh, scientific data. And I'll also touch a little bit on open source. Um, after that, I'll go over uh, why I chose to use Golang for this. And um, finally, I'll go over the different integration points we can use Golang on. All right, so I work for BioTeam, which is a company full of geeks uh, that are both into science and fast computers. Um, between the university in Florida and BioTeam, um, Aaron and I, or at least myself, I've been working in the field of life sciences for about four years. Um, and right now I'm mainly focusing on high throughput DNA sequencing workflows, um, commonly known as next gen sequencing. I feel very fortunate. Okay. Yeah. Um, Apologize for the technical difficulties. All right, uh, so I feel very fortunate and excited to be working with this type of data. And even though I'm mainly um, in the background, All right, all right, I won't touch it. <laughs> all right, um, so I don't really have any formal background in bioinformatics, um, although I like to pretend I do. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited about working with this type of data because it helps answer a few of humanity's great questions. Um, and that is, how does a sequence of four molecules make up who we are? And um, how can we use this knowledge to improve the human condition? Uh, so let's go over a few of the data formats used in DNA sequencing. Uh, the picture you see on the right is a sequencing instrument made by a company called Illumina. Uh, this particular instrument is called the NexSeq. Um, every year this technology gets better and better. Um, we're able to read more base pairs per run. Uh, we're able to um, run more samples at a time. And um, we're able to do this faster than we've ever been able to do before. Uh, so every day this instrument can spit out quite a bit of data, um, many, many gigabytes per run. Uh, the sequencing data size isn't as impressive as what you'd see in a field like uh, microscopy, uh, but at the same time I don't think the data size is insignificant. Uh, so this data requires multiple steps of processing to extract meaningful information. Uh, we call these series of steps a bioinformatics pipeline or workflow. Uh, the processing and storage of this data is a perfect fit for IRODS. Uh, the data exists in many different forms and states during its processing through the pipeline, and each of these various states require a different access pattern. Um, in addition to that, uh, 
you'll want to access this data at different speeds depending on the type. And um, using this information, um, it's best to try to optimize the pipeline. All right, so um, as you all learned in Jason's advanced training, um, IROD's composable resources provide a great solution to this problem. Uh, so let's go over a few of these formats briefly. Um, straight off the instrument, you have your BCL files, and these are basically the raw files that come directly off the instrument. And, um, you know, these files kind of by themselves aren't really meaningful, uh, so processing has to take place to extract meaning. Um, these BCL files are converted to FASTQ files, and FASTQ files are simply a plain text sequence of the DNA nucleotides, uh, A, T, G, and C. And um, a few steps run in between. Uh, typically, quality, con quality control check is run. Um, cleaning and trimming of the data takes place. Assembly alignment. Um, and finally, these FASTQ files are combined into the BAM and SAM format. Um, Yeah, that, that might work. <laughs> the BAM and SAM files um, are usually compared against a reference genome. And the result of that comparison is essentially a diff um, of the base pairs. Um, and this diff file format is called VCF, which stands for Variant Call Format. Um, so you can categorize these data formats into four different groups um, that make up the sequencing pipeline. You have your raw data, which is the BCL files. You have your primary data, FASTQ your secondary, which is the BAM and SAM, and um, third, you have your VCF files. All right, so you can see that we have these four categories kind of lined up on the top. Um, the two IROD servers designate, designated as consumers beneath that, and you have your physical media, which is represented um, as storage resources in IROD, IRODs. Um, the different types of storage media, uh, you know, you have your slower types like tape media or normal spinning hard drives. Um, on the faster side, you have SSDs and, of course, RAM. Uh, so when you think about the sequencing pipeline during processing, there are many reads and writes that take place on the data. Uh, so in this... Uh, so in this case, um, it could all be stored on uh, fast media, and that's during processing. Uh, once the initial... All right, so once the initial... All right, so um, you have these, you know, different sequencing file formats, and you can bend them into four different categories. Um, and depending on the category, uh, you can choose to access them on different types of media. Uh, so your VCF files, those are kind of the main files that give meaning to the data. Um, so you want to access those very fast, and you want to query those very fast. Um, the, uh, the raw data, um, not so much. Um, it's mainly for archival purposes. And um, this is important for um, experiment reproducibility. So if someone needs to go back and um, access the raw data, find out what parameters were used in these uh, uh, different utilities that were used to convert the data, um, that's a very you know, important job, but doesn't require uh, super fast storage. 
All right. Uh, so this is kind of the full picture I'm working towards in IRODS. Um, you know, we have the web UI, which is kind of the primary interface. Um, this might sound disturbing to some of you, but uh, my end goal is to really deprecate use of the I commands. Um, I'd like to create an interface so powerful, um, really the I commands are needed. Um, so using this interface, you could invoke workflows of rules, um, microservices, and processes. Uh, you can view the status and output of these rules and workflows, and you could also search and discover the in-flight and process data. Um, second, you have the IRODS rule engine, which acts uh, kind of like the data brain. Um, over here on the right, you can see a screenshot of an application called Logically, uh, and this is a basically an online game uh, that I play because I'm a geek, where you can visually compose circuits. Uh, so I think having a similar interface uh, where you can visually compose your workflow automation and connect your microservices and rules together um, in a visual way would really bring down the barrier of entry into IRODS. Um, and you know, if, if this was powerful enough, maybe it could even replace uh, the native IRODS uh, rule DSL. Um, so yeah, using the rule engine, you could invoke these multi-step data processing pipelines. Um, you could send the data for, um, you know, distributed compute nodes. Uh, you could set up tiered storage. Um, and you could even, you know, geographically distribute backups using IRODS. Um, on this next si slide, I'll probably be preaching to the choir. Um, but I think open source is really important. Um, for me, I really, during my development, want to add to the total sum of human knowledge and computational ability. Um, the reason for that is I think we can work faster and achieve more together. Um, and you know, really, there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. Uh, that is, unless you're reinventing a better wheel. Um, I also think if an idea is worth creating, it's worth sharing. Uh, so I'll stop my preaching there. All right, so now we'll get into a biased explanation of the uh, Golang programming language. Uh, I think the most important point is Golang is my favorite programming language. Um, it plays very nicely with C and C++ via CGO. Um, so you can call out uh, using Golang to C and C++ functions. And uh, the inverse is also true. You can export functions um, to, uh, to a C function and um, you can also use other languages like Python, Ruby, to actually call those exported C functions. So it really plays nicely with the community. Um, Golang is very, it's a very fast language. It's compiled down into machine code. Um, the syntax kind of enforces a simple design. Uh, there's really only one way to skin a cat in Golang. Uh, it also encourages consistency. Um, when you're reading the documentation online, um, they really hammer on the concept of writing idiomatic Go code. Um, Go is also very modular. Um, uh, uh, if, you're, if you have a library in Go, it's referred to as a package. And uh, these packages share a lot of common interfaces, which I'll show you a little bit later. Um, so this enforces uh, sturdy code. And also in Golang, um, there is explicit error handling. So if there's a function that returns an error, you have to explicitly ignore that, which is never good. Um, and this prevents kind of wrapping your code in a huge try-catch statement. Uh, Golang also has an excellent standard library. Um, you can do lots of things just right out of the box. Um, the standard tool chain is also amazing. Uh, it's got utilities for code profiling, uh, CPU profiling, memory profiling. Um, it's got a testing framework um, and lots, lots more. Uh, and the Go community is really great. Um, every day you see new Go packages popping up, and uh, it's just, it's amazing how fast uh, Go as a programming language is growing. Um, Go also supports a concurrency model for dummies. Um, I find uh, concurrent programming very difficult, um, kind of parallelizing your algorithms. It's, it's pretty tough in other languages, but with Go, um, they figured out a way to make that easy. Uh, deployment of Go is also very easy. If, um, if the libraries and packages you're using are written in pure Go, um, all of it can compile down into a single binary, which is really convenient for deployment. Um, there are no dependencies to install. Uh, everything is basically right in there in the binary, and the binaries are pretty small. 
Um, so kind of my end goal with uh, Golang development is I want to commoditize iRod's development for the Golang community. I want it to be so easy for someone who knows Go uh, to pick up iRod's and be um, productive and efficient in writing iRod's plugins. All right, uh, so here's a visual diagram of how in my mind I kind of think how iRod's works. On the bottom you have your iRod's clients. Those connect to your RPC listener. Uh, those call the core functions, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the request kind of moves through these different iRod's components um, all the way down to the end where it calls microservices. Um, so each place you see a gopher, uh, these are the integra integration points I've explored. Um, so I've written a, a Go client library called GoRods, uh, which sits right on top of the client. I've also written a uh, rule engine in Golang. And um, just recently I've um, implemented uh, bindings for microservices. So in this presentation I'll go through examples of each of those. Um, and last but not least, you have your RPC API plugins. And um, I haven't actually explored these in depth. Um, I haven't written any code uh, to bind in this context, but I thought I'd mention it um, just because I think it's important and that's probably the direction we're going. All right, so um, here are the, here's the list of those different integration points. You have, uh, first we'll focus on the iRod's clients. Um, some common use cases for an iRod's client library would be developing a RESTful API, um, implementing a web dev server, um, writing a web application, and even um, integrating in remote compute. So you can have like Slurm or SGE running and be totally unaware of iRod's. And um, you know, if you have an iRod's client library sitting on um, one of those compute nodes, they can talk back to the iCAT server um, ingest data back and maybe even assign metadata. All right, so now um, I'll actually talk about the binding I've written called GoRods. Um, it's on GitHub. Uh, this is my long and hard to spell last name, but uh, this URL will pop up in a few subsequent slides. Um, so a few cool features about GoRods. It, um, it's a C API binding via CGO. Um, it supports the latest version of iRods, 4.2.1. Uh, just last, last week I tested uh, compiling against 4.2.1 and everything seems to be working. Um, GoRods provides some efficient options for memory management. Um, and I've actually gone through quite a few iterations of this and um, I think I've finally uh, solidified the best option for memory management, uh, which I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, the repository also contains a working example for an HTTP user interface. Um, and this user interface actually supports uh, byte range requests. So if you have a tool um, for concurrent HTTP downloads like ARIA2, uh, this is a way where you can um, fire off multiple HTTP requests and kind of download uh, your data object in chunks. Um, everything is also fully documented on godoc.org. Uh, I spent a lot of time writing the comments and documentation, so uh, yeah, go check it out. Um, now, GoRods is a little different from Tomcat, and I'll explain these differences in the stack diagram I have to the right. Um, for, uh, or for jargon, you have, uh, you know, if, if you're connecting from a web client, uh, that web client will talk to Tomcat. Uh, Tomcat will subsequently talk to iRod's REST, which is implementing jargon. Um, that will be compiled into Java bytecode, which will be interpreted by the JVM. And finally, that code is executed on the operating system, and uh, that's where the syscalls are run. Um, to the right, you have the uh, GoRod stack, which is a little bit smaller. Um, you have your web client, and that talks directly to the GoRod's binary. There's no web server in between. And um, included in that binary is a pretty small Golang runtime and garbage collector. Um, and all of that code is compiled down into native machine code. Um, so as you can see, uh, um, if, you look up some, if you look up benchmarks online for some commonly implemented algorithms, uh, Go is usually a little bit quicker. Um, and I've actually seen pretty good performance with Go rods where we're approaching native I command speed. And um, the reason for that is because it uses some of the same code paths. 
All right, so now let's get into some code. Um, here's an example of creating a connection to iRods using the GoRods client library. Um, you pass in a few parameters, your host, your port, your zone, and your username and password. Um, this also supports uh, PAM authentication, uh, tickets, so um, it it's, uh, supports a lot. I think there's a few authentication methods uh, that it doesn't support, but uh, we'd like to work on those. Um, and finally, on line 23, you can see we check for an error, and if an error occurs, we um, exit the program and log that to a, um, your standard error output. Um, here's an example of opening a collection and looping over the objects. Uh, we specify our path, and beneath that, we uh, include a callback handler, which um, you're passing in your collection reference and your connection reference. And using the collection reference, we can iterate over all of the data objects, we can iterate all <coughs> over all of the collections, um, and we can print that to your standard output. Uh, so h over here on the right, you can see um, what the output might look like. Um, I'd also like to note that, uh, you know, these, these collection objects can also do a lot more than just um, extract the name of a data object. Uh, you can add and modify metadata, um, and you can also do the same with ACLs and much more. So um, it's pretty powerful and supports a lot of the um, IROD's client functionality. Um, here's an example of um, the HTTP server included in the GoRods repository. Uh, you simply pass in a path that you're using as kind of your entry point for clients. Um, this uh, download parameter um, will send special headers to force a download by the browser as opposed to actually rendering the content in the browser. And um, we can also uh, mount this at a specific path um, in HTTP. So in this case, we're just mounting it to forward slash irods. Uh, then we create our HTTP multiplexer, um, and then we listen and serve on port 8080. Uh, so in 18 lines of code, you can set up this, uh, this HTTP server that includes um, a pseudo REST API um, that actually has uh, AJAX requests um, passing data back and forth. All right, and this is kind of what the basic um, output of that looks like in your browser. Um, in this case, we're editing metadata. All right, and um, this code example I'm pretty excited about. This is um, an example of reading data and concurrency in, um, in Golang. So the first thing we do is we create an output buffer. Um, and uh, the second thing we do is we call a Go routine, and this is kind of a lightweight thread. Uh, so inside this Go routine, we read data in chunks. I think these chunks are about 10 megabytes a piece. And we push those data chunks into the output buffer. Uh, but since this Go code block returns immediately, um, in the main Go routine, you'll actually start writing uh, from the output buffer to the client. And if the output buffer fills up, this go routine will wait until there's an empty slot uh, before reading more data from IRODs. And the same is true if the output buffer is empty. Um, if it's empty, uh, this for loop will actually wait until it has data, and um, once it does, it'll write the output. Oops. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, there's actually no memory copying going on. Um, the data that is read from IRODs is not copied into Golang. Um, it's basically the raw uh, C memory. Um, this is a little bit inconvenient. Um, normally in Golang, the, um, you would need to copy the memory into a garbage collected variable. Uh, but in this case, we're not because we want it to be more efficient, but we have to explicitly free up the memory after use. Um, so this isn't optimal, but in a, uh, in a subsequent example, I'll actually show you how we can uh, do without this explicit free call. Uh, here's another cool example of some Golang utilities. In this case, it's the CPU profiler. Uh, so this will tell you 
kind of how long each function takes to execute in relation to the you know, whole execution time. And using this information, you can optimize functions and um, tweak them if you see that they're running slower than they should be. All right, so you can also use IRODs um, to invoke remote compute. Um, so in this case, you know, you, you might have a shared distributed file system and then you'd have a few compute nodes running Slurm or uh, Oracle Grid Engine. So if the Slurm and Oracle Grid Engine have a utility with GoRods installed, um, they can basically become IRODs aware. And uh, now, now they can, um, you know, extract metadata in a distributed fashion and then re-ingest that metadata into the IRODs catalog. All right, um, next we'll go over microservices in the IROD's rule language DSL. Um, with this component and integration point, you can automate data processing, uh, you can op automate your business logic and data management, and you can also enable replica-based distributed computation. Uh, so here's a visual of where that integration point would be. And um, I'd like to, to announce a new GoROD sub-package called MSI. Um, everything is on GitHub ready to go, so if, if you like programming in Go, uh, go check it out. Um, I, I wrote this sub package uh, specifically for this user group meeting, so um, I hope you like it. Um, it includes instructions on how to spin up a Vagrant box, and this is about 2.5 gigabytes, uh, so if that's too much, it also provides instructions on how to manually, um, manually build and install the microservices yourself. Uh, so here's an example of the MSI package in use. In this case, we're calling the MSI associate key value pairs to data object microservice. Uh, we're passing in a variable that contains the key value pairs. We're specifying the IRODs logical path, and um, we're telling IRODs the type of data. In this case, it's a data object. Um, so in the IRODs UGM repository, uh, where I provide all these demos, um, there are two different microservices. The first one is kind of a basic example, and all this microservice does is um, takes a two-column CSV file, converts it into a key value pair struct, and um, out outputs that uh, to the screen. It also provides an example of uh, unit testing, so if you're really into testing, uh, that would be good to check out. And um, it also includes a more advanced example that uh, utilizes Google Cloud Vision and the translation API to extract meaningful metadata using machine learning. Um, and optionally, you can compress data objects. So um, I think this is a really cool. All right, so uh, here, here's a basic example um, of the microservice included in that demo repository. Uh, we include our C package, which allows us to create a C binding. We export our basic example function, which accepts two parameters of the MS param type. Uh, we configure the MSI package and pass in the rule execute info pointer. Um, and on, then on the next two lines, we uh, convert the input pointers into uh, Golang types, um, which are the MSI types for the MS params, and then finally we convert that into a native Golang string. Um, on the second line, uh, we're actually converting the second output parameter to a v key value pair type. Um, and then after that, we simply call a function that you can't see here, uh, but essentially what that does is it returns a map, and um, that map contains a key and value pair, so we set the output variable using that map and return success. So uh, you can see that in 34 lines, you can write an IROD's microservice in Go that's compiled down to a, uh, you know, um, machine code as a shared object. So here's an example of um, where that integration point would sit, and it connects to the Google Cloud API. Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, this next part illustrates Go's interfaces. So what we do is we convert these, um, these data object 
descriptors into an IO reader writer. And Go interfaces are really cool because um, they're used throughout IRODs or um, they're used throughout Golang code and they're shared between packages. So um, if you use these interfaces, your code is very interoperable. Um, so essentially all we're doing is creating a reader, we're creating a writer, and then we're using io.copy and that takes care of all the work. Uh, so essentially what we're doing here is checking to see if gzip compression is enabled. And if it is, we're using the gzip uh, writer to compress that data. And here's kind of a similar example um, using the Cloud Vision uh, machine learning API. So I think this is around like 10 lines of code. So this integrates with the machine learning API in 10 lines of code. I think that's pretty powerful. Um, in terms of memory management, I was talking about kind of the third and final uh, method I've discovered where you can um, you can reduce the memory copies and at the same time not explicitly free your memory after use. Um, and the way we do this is we attach a function to the go garbage collector. Uh, so whenever this variable goes out of scope, um, the memory is automatically freed by go's garbage collector. Uh, so that's, that's really powerful, I think. All right, so let's run some data through um, MSI extract image metadata. Uh, here we have a uh, gopher, and you can see using Google's API, we've extracted some information about this image. So it's a mammal, it's a vertebrate, a uh, wildlife squirrel. Um, I don't think it got gopher, so they've got some work to do. Um, and it also provides a translation in Dutch. Um, in addition to that, there's also some EXIF data that's extracted and assigned <coughs> as metadata. Um, <laughs> Here's the, uh, an animation of my dog eating a, eating a cheeseburger. So uh, let's, see, let's see, we've got dog, a mammal, vertebrate, dog-like mammal, pit bull, American pit bull terrier. So that's pretty good. Um, it's pretty much right on the dot. I think the cheeseburger probably gave it away. All right, and last but not least, uh, Jason. So if you're like me, you probably have a photo of Jason sitting around on your infrastructure. Uh, so let's, let's pass this through Google's machine learning API. Uh, so we have, let's see, long luscious hair, uh, facial hair, face, nose, uh, likely in a hair metal band. All right, that's, that's spot on. <laughs> All right, and uh, that's, that's probably it. All right, yep, that's it. I don't want to miss out on this rule engine part. Um, I know it's lunchtime. Uh, it, can you talk about the rule engine work in one minute or less? Uh, yeah, sure. I can. Oh, a lightning talk. Ooh. Okay, lightning well, talk. Well, I don't know. One minute. Have a good one minute. All right, let's do this. So, um, what we've done with the rule engine is we fully um, integrated the rule engine plugin and created a binding in Golang for that. Uh, so this would be a step above microservices, and an example might be, um, you know, sending a stream of messages coming straight from your rule engine uh, to a web API, kind of for live updates. So there's no need to pull a REST API. Uh, basically, the data is coming straight off the rule engine. So this is a parser that's somewhere else, or is it? Where is it running? Um, so the rule engine, uh, I'll, I'll show you a code example. Maybe that will uh, shed some light. Uh, so here's an example of the rule engine. Um, we define a few rules for the AC post proc for put pep. And um, this is kind of a similar example that you'd see um, in the IRODS documentation. We simply pass in an image file using iput, and then it will extract the EXIF metadata and assign it as key value pairs. Um, so all of this is compiled into uh, machine code. It's linked to the IRODS uh, libraries. Um, so it's you know, very fast, very tightly integrated with IRODS. Uh, next we have um, the entire default IRODS rule set integrated in Go. And um, this is kind of similar to the C++ rule engine, except it's written in Go. And um, unfortunately, we're still working on this. Uh, we're not able to release it open source quite yet, uh, so stay tuned.
So the idea is that you could potentially run only that rule engine and not the one with the iRodge rule language or with the default C++ backstop. Yep, that's correct. Okay. Um, you can actually configure the rule engine um, and if you pass in the Boolean variable to load default rules, that will include that default rule set. Right. Uh, so your rule engine can run kind of standalone. Right. That's right. Yeah, so your deployments become extremely simple and, and you know, and keep, and keeping in sync across different systems very easily. Okay. All right. Yep, that's it. Excellent. Thank you. And obviously if there is demand or you want to give a, a lightning talk and, you know, take more time, that's fine. We have a few slots, I think, this afternoon. Uh, it is now time for